Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to Module 6. So, you know, we have spent this week talking about thermoelectricity, which is kind of a very different phenomena from the things we talked about earlier this week. And this is just a short module I wanted to kind of sum up what we did a little bit. And as you know, the basic thing that we have been discussing is this current flow through a device. And one of the important points that I made earlier is that if we, that this whole idea of an elastic resistor, that if you assume that your channel is elastic, and that is a technical word in this context, it's used to mean that when an electron goes through the thing from one side to another, it does not exchange energy with the surroundings. And so when you have an elastic resistor, the, all the heat is actually, all the ex energy exchange takes place in the contacts. And when you have something like that, see, this idealized, this idealized quant quant thing, the elastic resistor, it's really a very important, it's very useful conceptual tool when trying to understand transport. This is a point that I'd made earlier, you know, like in the very first lecture, the ones before the modules, the one with the scientific, in the scientific overview, that when an electron goes through the device without exchanging energy, that's what you might call a purely mechanical process described by the laws of mechanics, and which is very different from this process of energy exchange at the two ends. which one could call thermodynamics, which involves this generation of heat, something that is driven by what the technical word would be entropy. And these are two branches of physics that evolved completely separately, that mechanics started with Newton, and it was based on looking at planetary motion, which is like no friction is involved, whereas Many, where well, centuries later, when heat engines came along and people understood that heat is also a form of energy, that's when people learned to describe how heat flows. And all of this was put together in this general subject of what's called statistical mechanics. See? And one of the important equations of statistical mechanics, as I mentioned, is this Boltzmann transport equation, BTE, and which roughly which could be described as something that combines Newton's laws with scattering processes, you know, processes that involve energy exchange, with energy exchange processes or entropy-driven processes, sort of. And so, in general, in the semi-classical picture, all discussions of transport, all discussions of current flow, usually start from the Boltzmann transport equation. That's like widely used, in fact, not just for electrons, for things like neutrons, phonons, all kinds of things. And so many of the results that we have obtained, so for example, just this week, one of the things we did was we obtained, took this expression for current and wrote it in terms of this conductance and this G sub S and the Seebeck coefficient. And we obtained expressions for these things. You know, for the conductance, we had an expression that looked like this. And when we wanted the G sub S, there was like this additional factor in there with E minus mu over QT, I believe. And we obtained, you know, expressions for all these transport coefficients. These are all standard expressions. So not that these are unknown things that we are doing for the first time. These are all known. But usually the derivation of these things would all start from the Boltzmann equation. You see, that would be the starting point. Whatever we discussed, whatever we discussed in this part of the course, again, the, the proper rigorous way of doing it would be to start from Boltzmann equation. You see? 
On the other hand, it takes a lot of work, a lot of time to get used to the Boltzmann equation because I think I tried to give you a bit of a flavor of what is involved in that last module of week three, what it looks like. And it's a you know, differential equation with many independent variables. You see, there's the, and then, then there is this entropic processes which are described by an integral. So overall you have this integral differential equation and it takes quite a bit of effort to get used to all that. And a lot of that you see we were able to bypass and do relatively simply in this course because we used this idea of an elastic resistor. Because in an elastic resistor as I had explained in my scientific overview chapter, the mechanics is separated from the thermodynamics. So the M from the T, they're separated. And so when it came to the thermodynamics, the part that involves all these quote unquote entropy driven processes, which we really haven't discussed at all well. We haven't really gone into any depth at all. And the reason we have been able to bypass them completely is we say that, well, you know, they're all confined to the contacts. And what they do is they simply maintain the two contacts in thermal equilibrium. So this contact, the electrons are always distributed according to F Fermi function F1. This contact, it is always distributed according to Fermi function F2. This is the part that is allowed us to take care of something very complicated. So you see, if we look at our equation here, I've got F1 minus F2. So it's assumed that those two contacts are always maintained in thermal equilibrium, F1 minus F2. And we do not need to know very much more than that about what is going on in the contact, all the complicated processes that go on in the contacts. So is this a relevant model? Well, as I had mentioned before, in small devices, this seems to be approximately true, you see, because people have been running currents through these carbon nanotubes, which are fairly small, you see, they run currents through this. And if all the associated heat were generated here, it would have burnt up because this is just a small thing. It can't get rid of all that heat so easily. And it's believed the reason it doesn't burn up is because the heating is here, elsewhere, you see. And these are of course big contacts which can get rid of the heat. So that's why there is, it, it is believed it's not burnt up. And so in these small devices, there seems to be, one could say there's experimental evidence that say there is indeed this separation between the heating and the mechanics, what I was talking about. And of course you might say, well, but then if that's not true, you know, if you're talking about bigger devices, does that mean everything we are talking about is irrelevant? Well, not exactly, because in the beginning I tried to justify that when you have a big device, you could still conceptually think of as lots of little devices in CDs, one after the other. So what we did was we thought we analyzed one of the small devices and we calculated, say, the transport coefficients, its conductivity, its pair or its Seebeck coefficient, etc for a small thing, but that's okay. When you have a long thing, you just have lots of them in series, that's fine. The main, of course, important conceptual point, which is why this wasn't done before, because people didn't understand that well, is the fact that when you break it up this way, every time there's this conceptual interface, there's also an interface resistance associated with that, which doesn't really exist because this is a conceptual interface, not a real one. So when analyzing real structures, you should not be including this extra interface there. So for example, you might have concluded, let us say we have a little ballistic section. As we know, the conductance of a ballistic section is let's say 25 kilo ohms divided by the number of modes. Okay, so now we put two ballistic sections together. So this is 25 kilo ohms, that's 25 kilo ohms. If I put it together, you might say, well, you should just add up the two and get 50. They are in series. But not really, because in an actual ballistic conductor, this 
contact in the middle isn't really there. So it is really just one long ballistic conductor, and so the conductance should really be just 25 kilo ohms. So, and there have been actually experiments people have done with structures like this, and whether you get 25 or 50 sort of depends on whether electrons go straight through or whether they are able to randomize their momentum in the intervening regions. Anyway, but the point I'm trying to make here is that when you think of big conductors as lots of little conductors in series, you have to be careful. You have to be careful about this interface resistance and take that into account. And this is the part that wasn't at all clear you know, 20, 30 years ago, but now it is very clear what it all is about. And that is what allows us to use this bottom-up approach. Bottom-up approach meaning where we start with small things, think of it as a elastic resistor, and thereby what happens is it allows us to get, to treat fairly complicated problems. We are obtaining, you know, ex expressions for things like this thermoelectric coefficients, as we did this, this week which again normally would have required you to understand the Boltzmann equation, but we can do it in a fairly simple way. And we got, again, simple connections between the Seebeck coefficient and the Peltier coefficient. Again, one of those things that usually is a lot more difficult. See, But here, it came out in a relatively simple way, and that is again because of the simplicity of the elastic resistor concept. Okay? And <clears throat> this approach, so the point I was making is that this approach, of course, today is also appears relevant for nanoelectronic devices, but one could use it to even understand bigger devices. Indeed, one could call this the Landauer approach because Rolf Landauer was the one who had proposed this like some 50 years ago as a way of conceptually understanding transport processes. And at that time, of course, there were no nanoelectronic devices and none of this looked experimentally relevant. And he was thinking of it more as a conceptual tool. And no one paid much attention to it really till the 90s when actually experiments came along and showed that much of this was even experimentally relevant. But what I have been trying to say is that uh, that is not only relevant for electronic devices, but there are lessons to be learned here and a whole viewpoint and perspective that should allow you to think about bigger devices as well. So it is really not just for nanoelectronics, it's for understanding a wide variety of problems. And that is the kind of thing we have kind of have to uh, try to give you a flavor for in this course, in all these, all these different topics that we went through. The first couple of weeks were about the, I guess, the basic idea, the, this way of looking at conductance, et cetera. Then one of the weeks we talked about the transistor, the nanotransistor. Again, of course, in this course, we are not so much interested in devices because, or because devices, of course, to learn properly, you have to learn from the experts, and each device is like a full semester's course on its own. But here I was using nanotransistors more just to illustrate the kind of issues that you have to worry about when you go beyond linear response. You see, a lot of what we discussed is based on this linear response. That is, you assume that mu1 and mu2 don't differ too much, or t1 and t2 don't differ too much, and so you linearize this equation. And in a transistor, of course, one is interested not just in linear response. In fact, that's a relatively minor part. What you're interested in, how the current saturates and things like that. And in that case, you can again use this viewpoint, but with caution. There are issues involved. I didn't discuss that all that much in the notes. Some of the issues are discussed. And next semester, Mark Lundstrom will be teaching a course on that. So where, you know, you learn about nanotransistors properly. The other point I wanted to quickly mention is that when you do this linear expansion, you might say, well, in order for the linear expansion to be valid, your voltage has to be very small because mu1 minus mu2, delta mu, should be much less than kT. And kT is like 25 millivolts. But resistors typically are linear not just for 25 millivolts, but for volts. Why is that? And my answer there would be that if you look at this structure, again, when you have long devices, you should think of it as little sections like this. And one of these sections is basically the length that you could consider to be essentially elastic. 
So when you, electrons go through the solid, people have a picture of how far an electron has to go before it exchanges energy with the surroundings. And so that is what you call the inelastic length. And the point is, since we are applying our method to a relatively small section, the voltage across that small section, the section of one inelastic length, that's what needs to be much less than kT. The total voltage across the entire device could be a whole lot bigger. It's only this little section that you are really analyzing when you are using this kind of a viewpoint to get some insight into bigger devices. Now, in this course, we have focused on what you call the semi-classical picture. That is, Newton's law for mechanics plus all these quote-unquote entropic processes, and that's what's the, uh, what forms this Boltzmann transport equation. Now, what we'll talk about in the next course is kind of the quantum version of this. That is, instead of Newton's laws, you have Schrodinger equation. That's what describes electrons as waves. You see, in this course, we haven't really touched much upon the wave nature of electrons. We have put it, included it, but in a relatively elementary way. We said, well, if electrons have a certain momentum, there is a corresponding de Broglie wavelength, and that wavelength must fit into the box. That was the idea we used in the second week to count the number of modes and to count the number of states. Yeah. So we haven't really put in the wave properties of electrons in a proper way. We just put it in kind of heuristically through that de Broglie wavelength. And in the next course, what we do is we'll actually include the wave nature of electrons through the Schrodinger equation, but we still need, of course, Schrodinger equation plus all these entropic processes, you see? And when you put them together, that's what you usually refer to as this NEGF method that is now widely used for analyzing small devices, you know, where quantum processes are involved, so things like tunneling and all that, if those are involved in devices, then instead of the Boltzmann equation, people use a description that's based on putting these two things together. And one of the things sometimes people say is, well, that looks like very difficult stuff. You see, it's got quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, and it's not even equilibrium statistical mechanics, we are talking non-equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics. That sounds like something very difficult, and, in, and it is. There are many facets to this that take time to master. But what we try to do in this course and in the next course is try to give you a big view of how these different things fit in, you see? You see, what all these courses we developed originally in response to students who told us that, well, I've taken some four semesters of quantum mechanics, but you see, I still quite don't know how to use it to analyze any real devices. And the reason you can see why, because if you know everything about the Schrodinger equation, you take a course on quantum mechanics, they will teach you a lot about the Schrodinger equation. If, if After you've learned all that, though, you still cannot analyze devices till you couple it with the quote-unquote entropic processes, because devices will inv inevitably involve contacts where energy exchange takes place. And all that requires this full framework, which you usually don't get in any course. And what allows us, we believe, to teach this at a rel relatively elementary level is just this concept of an elastic resistor. The idea that somehow the mechanics can be separated from the entropic processes and these com complicated entropic processes can be handled relatively easily with the by just by legislating a Fermi function or a Bose function as we did for phonons. And the next course, of course, as I said, the primary difference is we'll, we're doing all this using wave mechanics. So we'll use the wave properties of electrons. And as such, you'd expect it to be a little more difficult than this course because here we have been thinking of electrons as particles. Understanding wave properties is usually, a, we are less familiar with that than with the particle properties. I'll also, I think at the end of the course, try to explain to you the, these entropic processes a little more in depth. That is, this part about equilibrium statistical mechanics. I've always said, in this course, I've said, well, you have this Fermi function and I won't explain it any further, but that is something we'll try to explain a little better in the next course. Now, 
You might say, well, does that mean that after these five weeks and five weeks, it's like we have learned quantum mechanics and we have learned non-equilibrium statistical mechanics? Well, not really. I mean, you can view this sort of as a front web page. I mean, the whole idea is to show you how these all these things connect up, the overall pattern. And what we hope is that at least some of you will get in, interested enough and intrigued enough to learn all these subjects properly. You see, there are, this is the front web page. You can click on anything and go on for a while. You can learn quantum mechanics properly. You can learn statistical mechanics properly. There's all kinds of things that you could follow up on and learn a lot more. But the whole purpose of this is just to give you a, I mean, get you interested enough so that you actually feel like you understand, learn all those things and see how it fits into what we are trying to do here. And even if you, you know, are not intrigued enough to really follow up on all that, hope I, I hope that at least you see how this starting from the bottom up with this idea of an elastic resistor, it gives you a very different perspective on how current flows. Namely, as I said, if you take any freshman physics text, they'll start by telling you that current flows because there's an electric field inside the conductor. And the point is that's really not right because if electrons float due to electric fields, then all the electrons in the solid should start moving and not just a few that are near the electrochemical potential. The fact is whether a solid is a conductor or an insulator, overall they all have about the same number of electrons. It is just that in metals, right around the chemical potential, there's a lot of states. In insulators, right around the chemical potential, there isn't much. And so what determines whether something conducts or not is really this density of states or modes right around the chemical potential. And what causes electrons to flow is simply that one contact tries to fill up those states and the other contact tries to empty them. And, and if that is a much clearer and more correct view of you know, how current really flows in the small solids, in not just small conductors, but even in bigger conductors really. And I hope you kind of enjoy that different perspective, which at this time is not a textbook thing that you'll normally hear of.